Okay, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining in tonight's webinar. This is a research conversations webinar on um, research training and it's hosted by the Australian and New Zealand Medical Radiation Research Network. This is something that we do every couple of months just to cover new topics that relate to um, areas of research that are of interest to medical radiation practitioners within Australia and New Zealand and um, internationally as well. So we've got a, a fantastic panel here this evening. And what I might do is ask the panel members just to um, briefly introduce themselves, tell us um, your name and where you're from and which area that you're involved in researching. So I might start with um, Rhonda Joy. Hello, I'm Rhonda Joy Sweeney. Um, I'm in Auckland, New Zealand. My background is diagnostic medical imaging and mammography. I teach at the University of Auckland of the postgraduate and a new undergraduate program. I'm currently completing my PhD through the uh, University of Sydney, but I consider myself very much a novice researcher. I'm learning so much. So that's me, thank you. And my area of interest is mammographic <coughs> image quality. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Rhonda Joy. Paul, I've just noticed you've joined us. Do you mind um, turning on your mic and introducing yourself? Would that be okay? Sure. Um... Hi everyone, um, I'm Paul Keane. I'm a lecturer at the University of Otago, Wellington. Uh, we're with the National Radiation Therapy Programme for uh, New Zealand. Um, I'm also enrolled in a PhD. Um, I've done a research master, so I have a tiny little bit of experience and I'm progressing my research training. Uh, although I don't think that that will ever quite uh, finish. Uh, I'm, a partic I'm particularly interested in uh, educational research, um, so topics in and around um, how we work with students, their learning, good teaching practice, that kind of thing. Thanks a lot, Paul. Now I'll ask Kelly to introduce herself. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Kelly. I work at Monash University. So I finished my PhD way too long ago now, um, 13 years, I think. Um, so uh, I've worked, my PhD was in clinical um, in prostate radiation therapy. And so I still have uh, an interest in the clinical side of it, but obviously working in academic now, uh, teaching into our bachelor's program and also our online eclipse program, our cloud based eclipse program for the master's program. Um, and I supervise a few PhDs, one who's just finished from Singapore, so, um, and then a couple that are still uh, part way through. Thanks a lot, Kelly. Andrew, could you please introduce yourself? Sure. Um, I'm Andrew Kilgour. I am the Head of Discipline for Medical Radiation Science at Charles Sturt University. My background is diagnostic. I've graduated from my PhD December last year. I'm a bit of a rare bird in MRS in that my research is qualitative rather than quantitative. And my thesis was um, the role of professional judgment in assessing workplace learning in radiography students. Thanks, Andrew. And Will, will you please introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Will Ray. I'm a medical physicist. I teach um, radiographers the physics of imaging. I did my PhD some time ago and I've successfully supervised quite a few students to completion in mostly in the field of um, quantitative image analysis. Um, so I've looked particularly at the quality of mammography, mammography tumor quantification, radiomics features and that sort of thing. And I have an interest in a variety of different research topics. And at the moment we are involved in some dosimetry projects and um, artificial intelligence, deep learning kind of projects and things like that. So we've got a variety of students and I have students at various levels of research and I enjoy teaching them and I enjoy uh, interacting with them and encouraging them in their research studies. Thanks a lot, Will. <clears throat> and finally, Zong Hu from Curtin University. 
Thanks, Peter. And hello, everyone. And Zong Hua Sun from Curtin University, plus WA. I'm head of discipline of medical reading science, Curtin University. And mainly my research focus on cardiovascular imaging, uh, specifically cardiac CT and also uh, 3D printing. I'm supervising a couple of PhD students currently working on 3D printing in congenital heart disease or aortic disease. So that's the one of the priorities we are focusing in on our program. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you, panel members. So I just wanted to say for, um, for our other participants, if you'd like to ask questions during the webinar, please feel free to type something into the actual um, chat box that's available through the Zoom meeting. And I'll keep an eye on those and where, when I can, I'll interject and, um, and um, ask those questions. I see Gay's online, you might be able to help me as well, Gay. If I'm getting um, distracted and not asking those questions, could you please jump in and, and have a look at those as well for me? Thanks so much. Um, so the topic tonight is talking about research training and research training is a really broad topic. So I've divided it into, a, into two different areas and um, well, the way I've decided to divide it is, is to call it either informal research training, which might relate to things that you go and do as far as looking at articles or attending webinars such as this or something that you do at a conference, and formal research training, which is more a structured course program that you might do either as an undergraduate student as part of your honours or come back as a postgraduate student and do something research training in your um, coursework masters, or it could be part of a master's research or a PhD. So we're gonna try and cover a broad area <clears throat> this evening, but I thought I'd start with talking about um, inform informal research training. And this can be self-guided, self-directed uh, training that you um, set up and do yourself. And it can be as straightforward as looking at um, articles that are available on research methodology. And Rhonda Joy, do you mind if I jump to you? I know you've provided quite a comprehensive list and this shows us some of the places that you've gone to um, during your research journey as a PhD student. What I'll do is I think I might be able to, I'm not sure if I can share my screen, but certainly if I can't, what I'll do is, um, I'll circulate these to all the members of this particular meeting. So I've got everyone's email addresses. So I'll send it out as an email um, to everyone. So we've got that particular list. Rhonda Joy, do you mind um, telling us about um, how useful this sort of um, method of finding guidance in your research training journey was? Thanks, uh, Peter. Um, I've always liked to um, question what I did when I was in the clinical role, um, which actually took me into my PhD. Well, there's my list. This list that I collated was, um, I found the language of research quite daunting at times, really wasn't too sure. So it was very comforting to find um, a literature that had been published about the methodology and methods of research, but were based in medical imaging and radiography. So that gave a framework, obviously, for anybody at any level to um, contextualise the learning about the uh, methods of research and not have to relearn a double set of language within it was contextualized, was always already within radiography. Can I tell you that's a small list, there's actually a textbook I use, there's a lot more resources. What I've done with this particular list has, um, these are all readily available, um, uh, freely, free, uh, freely available on the, um, uh, by Googling for these basically. And what I find for a lot of people when I try to encourage them to think about introducing research into their lives and into their practice is that they don't necessarily have access to university libraries. So this list is freely available. They're all about radiography. Um, and of course the set by Marshall is particularly useful. Right down to the little one where maybe it might be from a project perspective of starting off with a questionnaire um, and a survey. So I ended up doing mixed uh, methodology, um, a sequential um, explanatory, and it started off with a survey and a questionnaire. Then I introduced a whole, no, it was a whole other subject, a think aloud technique, which has only been um, published once before in, the, in radiography, but I also took a different approach with it. So I guess my method or message 
was that to um, use our own resources as a profession. Um, Metsala at Helen, I think 2018, published um, trying to understand how we describe research in, within um, radiography. And the table of statistics are quite interesting. We, talk, we think it's all quantitative, but there is an awful lot of qualitative. And mixed methodology is really quite a recognized field now by, the, by APA. And they've actually, it's not on this list, have actually published now um, um, uh, recommendations if you are going to be publishing a mixed methodology, the APA rules around doing that. So it was very comforting for me having gone down that, um, that road that it was quite a valid way to be. So that's just a wee bit of background to me to, if I want to encourage people in workshops or within my teaching or for myself to find a comfort zone with which to explore the methods and methodology of um, research. And there it was all available for us all the time. So thanks, Peter. Thanks, Rhonda Joy. I guess they're, they're journal articles, which um, you've indicated that most of them that you can get um, online and freely available. But um, I'm sure we all have access to hospital libraries or maybe have an affiliation with the university. And um, we can borrow textbooks on research methods and um, research um, analysis. But a lot of those libraries also have online textbooks that you can borrow. So that's a real trend that's happening in libraries now in that you don't have to go in and pick up a physical book. You can, um, you can actually download or borrow a, a digital version of it. Um, so even if you aren't a member of a, a university, there's nothing stopping you from going into um, your local university and using those library facilities and to study more and learn more about um, the various techniques that you wish to understand. And I'm sure the hospital libraries and department libraries um, also has some fantastic resources available. The, um, I'll just ask the panel members, is there anything they'd like to add to that particular topic as, as far as uh, research training that's available through either journals or textbooks? Um, Peter, Andrew here. Can I just yes. suggest that the list Rhonda Joy put up was great, but in my experience, we don't have to restrict ourselves to um, journals and information just around MRS, because I gained a lot from researching um, the background to what I was doing from other disciplines. In fact, my supervisors were both physiotherapists. And that's the thing, often you can't find um, sufficient literature on in the medical radiation sciences and you have to go and to the other allied health fields that have done similar type of research, similar methodologies to, um, to, to learn more and to support the research that you're doing. Um, Peter, it's Paul here. Uh, yeah. I was just going Thanks, to say, if, um, if people are uh, trying to get do this on an informal basis and they're they're accessing articles or particularly books um, sometimes books can be quite dense when you come to a topic for the first time um, and if you're approaching something which is a more generic um, research methods uh, type textbook that, that can be particularly daunting and as Rhonda Joy alluded to there's there's a language with the research world that you wouldn't necessarily have been introduced to. Um, I find it quite useful to go on to, dare I say, at YouTube and look up the authors of some of the textbooks which I have found interesting. And quite often you will find speaking sessions or lectures from those authors that, that will be uh, put up there in the public domain. And you actually get to hear those authors explaining their work um, to an audience. Uh, some of these might be an hour, some of them might be an hour and a half, but they're, they're really worth pursuing. And I know I've found that quite useful. Um, just hearing it from the horse's mouth, so to speak. That's a great suggestion. I did have a look at YouTube as a possible source of research training before tonight's meeting. And um, I think you can be guided when you're looking on YouTube, maybe look at possibly the university that they're from um, as a measure of credibility. Um, but I did see something interesting like writing a research pro proposal from the University of Birmingham. I didn't get a chance to review that, but I thought that would be a useful resource. So there are some really credible um, 
resources available on YouTube. And as Paul, as you mentioned, it's nice to make a connection with the author of that textbook or the article that you're reading. It makes it a, a little, feel a little bit more personal. Talking about online uh, resources, the other thing that, um, that I thought would be useful to look at is the massive open online courses. Now, I don't know if anyone's had an experience doing one of these MOOC courses as, as yet. I've been reviewing one that was put together by our um, discipline called Health, Life and Radiation this last week. And um, I've really enjoyed it. And, uh, and I had a look around to see what sort of um, research training would be available if on MOOCs as well. So this is through um, providers such as Coursera or edX, um, quite, uh, quite credible supply, supplies of MOOCs. And I saw things like understanding research methods by the University of London or qualitative research methods by the University of Amsterdam and MIT. Um, introduction to systematic review and meta-analysis by the University of Pennsylvania. Advanced clinical data science by the University of Colorado. So MOOCs are the sort of things that you can um, just go to and watch their videos. There's often um, learning resources and PDFs, quizzes for you to go along. You don't have to pay unless you actually want the qualification at the very end, a certificate that says you passed all the quizzes and assessment. And for me, it's the sort of thing that I've been doing in the morning while I've been um, doing the washing or bit of exercise, um, just making it part of my routine to, to do it. So that's, that's another um, possibility. Has any um, members of the panel come across MOOCs or other online resources other than YouTube that they found useful? There's a couple of comments, Peter, up on the chat. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So I'm just gonna have a quick read of the comments. Um, so thank you, Millard. There's, you mentioned you found the Trove, the National Library of Australia, very useful and a large database available to everyone. And a link has been provided. So can everyone see the link on the chat? I'll also circulate that after as well. Shane spoke to us as well. Most hospitals have library accesses to databases, or if you're graduated from a university, should be able to have an alumni library access and to the library and also to that library. Great. And he recommends Trove and says it's great. So thanks guys, thanks for your contribution. So another possible source of more informal training is that often we attend our professional society conferences and um, groups like ourselves will run workshops at those conferences to um, give you tips and, and ideas about research methodology. Has any members of our panel been um, part of one of those workshops in the past? Yeah, I have. So we've done um, publication workshops. We've done, um, I think we did one a few years ago developing a portion. So um, I can make sure it's something a bit different so that it's not the same. Kelly, I might get you to um, just repeat what you said. You just dropped out a second ago. Sorry, I just came up with a message saying I'm stable. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Um, okay. okay. Sorry. Um, the, I was just saying, I think we've done a few on publications, uh, a group workshop, which was, um, I think, I'm trying to remember what it was. I think it was that we, uh, it was developing a research question, so a proposal. Um, so every year we try and, whenever we put them together, try and cover a different topic um, and broaden the knowledge of people that, that attend. We do often see the same people. Great. And do you have one planned for um, ASMERT in 2020? I know Caroline, Caroline's not online. Caroline's the one organising the workshops and I know that it's been discussed, but I don't know I think, at this point, so I'm not sure. Okay. So I'll, just, I'll just add to that, Peter. Um, yeah. There's going to be two separate workshops at ASMR 2020, uh, which Kaz is organising, but uh, there's going to be a separate quantitative and qualitative workshop, um, uh, as well as an educational workshop. Uh, workshop so there's there's going to be quite a choice it's going to be quite busy with the, the workshops but there's going to be two separate ones for the two main paradigms and for the workshops are they do people have to register is there a fee involved or is it um just turn up 
I would imagine there will be some kind of registration if there's an additional fee. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, at the moment, there are two groups I'm part of one and we're, we're essentially figuring out exactly what we want to do. And then we make a, we give a, an outline of that to the uh, conference organizing committee. Um, I guess if you're going to ask about that, they will be quite happy to receive email queries about what the proposed arrangements are going to be. I just know I'm going to be there helping to run one and I'm, I'm not going to be charging directly, but you might give them <laughs> an idea there. <laughs> I'll just comment, in the past, they've not been an additional fee. It's usually been on the Thursday or the Friday morning. So earlier before the main bulk of the conference kicks off, um, but you did have to pre-register beforehand just for room sizes and all those sorts of things. So, um, I can't guarantee they're not going to be fee, but um... great. Thanks, thanks, Kelly and Paul. I guess the and the I... idea there is to um, to keep an eye out for that in your registration package yeah. because it may it may not appear obvious to you immediately, but um, keep an eye out for workshops and and ensure that you register for those um, if they're available. Can I come in there, Peter? Yes, Will. Um, I've attended some international conferences where they give quite niche. Um, courses. And so if you're going to an international conference, do look at all the workshops that are available there. Some of them might be teaching about how to do grant writing, which is quite useful, or how to contact the funders, or how to do writing in your particular niche field of that kind of conference. And so I found those quite useful. And there are basically, as has been mentioned, two types. Those that you would register for as additional courses and workshops and those that are part of the program and you can just attend them. Um, I've also attended what they have as morning courses which a small extra fee and every day they would look at a different aspect of a particular research field. But one of the things that I'd like to say in, in general, if we could go just go back a little bit, um, if we're doing research, most people are not actually studying research they're studying a particular problem. And so if, we, if you have your particular problem, you can oftentimes go to these various resources that we've mentioned and seek a solution just for that problem. You don't have to become an expert researcher. You have to be a, an efficient researcher. So you're not, you're not learning to, to know all of the terms in research and which kind of project you're doing. You need to know how do you use those tools for your project. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Will. And I know, um, I know, even within the university community, which might go more into what we're going to talk about next with formal um, uh, formal research training, is that often there's groups within the university set up that um, have. I know at, at Sydney they have something called Hacky Hour, where you can take your problems along and it could be a, an IT problem or it could be something you're trying to solve in Excel or, or with a MATLAB or some other problem. And there's a group of people there that are willing to sit with you and, and work through those issues, sort of a group coming together and um, trying to find solutions to particular problems. So I'll open up to the panel. Is there anything else you'd like to talk about in regards to informal research training before we move on to um, the more university or college-based formal methods of research training? Yeah, Peter, it's Kelly. Just um, yeah. I've turned my video off because I think my internet's unstable, so I'm still here. Um, Thanks, that's clear. The, um, one of the other things that was on there was in regards to things like professional societies and research centres or publishers that have a, a load of resources that often are online that you can, you can access. Um, so one that wasn't on the list, so obviously there's the previous webinars we've run, but Another one would be um, TROG have their annual conference that they run a research workshop um, for and usually for, um, uh, so they have data managers, but also researchers. Um, often hospital networks or university networks might run short course type things. So might be just um, often universities are aligned with some of the bigger hospitals as well. So you might be able to do uh, you know, an ethics course or a systematic review course or some of those just to get an idea of things that might be available. So keep an eye out on often newsletters. I mean, I know we all get spammed with lots of emails mm. in our hospital 
you know, in our email, we don't have time. Um, but often there might be short course advertising in those that might be worth having a look at. Yeah, so um, even the local health areas, um, I'm sure have sort of research groups and organisations. So thanks, Kelly, for reminding me of that. There's, um, at Sydney University, there's a number of organisations and I'm sure they're um, available at all universities, but we've got things like the Research Cancer Network, City, Sydney Catalyst, Sydney Vital, and they've got a range of courses for postgraduate students to help them out, but also courses for early career and mid-career researchers. So there's a whole range of webinars and um, and meetings and workshops that they hold. And they're free to join and, um, and really reach out with information about grants and workshops and um, a whole range of things that are interesting to the, the members of that particular group. So keep an eye out for those networks that are local to where you're based. Sorry, Peter, I'll just jump in. And yeah. Captain on there saying a good way to do informal training is to find a mentor and that's absolutely True. spot on. Whether that's formal or informal research is to have someone that you can you can go to and ask questions and you know you don't want to reinvent the wheel. Um, you know, find something that you can, you know, as you said, find a solution to, to your problem through potentially another field or someone else who's gone that gone down that path before. Thanks, Kelly. And thanks, Anne, for that contribution. That's so true. Um, well, we can always come back to the topic of informal training if, if others have thoughts as we go along. But I thought we'd jump into the more formal uh, method of research training. And as I said in the, in the introduction, this can um, go through your whole, um, your whole course or your whole uh, higher edu education career. So I guess the way that often starts is that undergraduate students are introduced to research methods and techniques as part of their um, past degree. But some students who have a passion or an interest in research can go on and do an honours program as part, of their, um, as part of their undergraduate degree. And depending on how your institution is set up, this may be something that's added at the end of a three-year degree and is performed as part of a, takes a, a year and you work closely with one or, one or more supervisors on a particular topic. Um, and or if it's a four-year program, often the honours program is embedded into the four-year undergraduate program. And you may start that in the third year, second semester of your program and go through to the end of the fourth year of your program in that honours. Um, so we can come back to these in details, but I just want to list them. The other, other options are um, once you finish your undergraduate program, you may want to do a coursework masters. And in that coursework masters, they may be research subjects and components. So you may have a choice of electives where you can pursue that and do a research um, topic or, or program, which makes up a number of units of study. Or you can do a dedicated research masters, or you can do a PhD. So why don't we go through those and talk about how you get into them, how they differ, and what is the experience for students in those types of programs, and what you might hope to achieve by doing each of those. So it might be, um, it might be good just to start with, with honours. And I've, um, I might ask members of our panels, um, anyone can put their hand up and contribute, but just tell us about maybe um, what the honours experience is at your institution and how students get into that particular program and what they may expect. Can I can start that, Peter. Sorry. Um, we... Um, we advertise to our students at Charles Sturt University at the end of second year, we hold a meeting, an honours information meeting for them. And if they have a credit average up to that point, they are eligible to apply. And we tell them, you know, decide on a, a topic you're interested in. We tell them which of the academic staff are eligible to supervise. And then they come and approach their potential supervisor individually and talk about it. And then they change their enrolment from pass to honours between second year and third year and do a specific honours research method subject in third year. And then in fourth year, they, um, they do a little bit less clinical placement to give them time to write their dissertation. And uh, we, we don't get that many every year, maybe four or five would be an average. And that's across um, 
radiography nuke med and RT. So that's pretty much in a nutshell what we do here at Charles Sturt. Thanks a lot, Andrew. Is there anything in addition that others would like to, to add as far as what's, what's happening at their institutions? Um, Paul here. Um, at Otago, we offer, a, it's a standalone research degree, um, our honours programme. Um, and that's um, two components. We, we always ask students to complete. Um, it's a full year uh, postgrad paper in health science research methods. Um, and that really helps to reinforce that the student is uh, going down the right direction in terms of the way they want to explore the topic they're interested in. So the, the paper exposes them to all sorts of research designs. Um, there's a little bit of stats, there's um, a little bit about various forms of clinical research. They learn about um, the terminology and the various tools that are available to you. Um, you hear from different sorts of qualitative researchers, that sort of thing. Um, and then it's um, it's normally done as a a, 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 a full year part time uh, where they're working on their uh, actual research project. But that would not normally be decided until they've done the research methods uh, paper, or uh, students uh, have been able to become part of a bigger study. So. There's been a number of clinical trials that have come out of the of our department that have been running across different centres. So students have been the researcher in a in a local centre, um, and their thesis, uh, their honours thesis, becomes the, uh, basically a write up of their contribution to that larger project. And um, so, a slightly different model, I think, to to what Andrew was talking about. Thanks, Paul. Anyone else have something to add? Yeah, Peter and Zhonghua from Curtin University. Yes. Yeah, we, we have a slightly different uh, honors stream. We introduced from last year, you know, honors uh, students can achieve their degree by two streams, almost by independent project, you know, that they can do independent study in the fourth year, and or honors by the special topics. I think most of students will follow the honors by special topics, you know, it's a 50 credit two semesters in the fourth year, they will complete a, a number of assignments, different topics. So normally in the, in the, at the end of the semester when year three, we'll, we'll send out the information or you know, call for express interest, you know, run the introduction session to students explaining the different streams. Uh, we don't have many students, you know, following the path by an independent project, pretty much talking about uh, three to five students per, semester, per year. So majority will do the almost by special topics. So that's, so they will decide they, you know, what they want to follow uh, at the end of year three. And the, yeah. the fourth year will do that, you know, the honors by that. And when you say special topics, are they topics that have been proposed by potential? Yeah, proposed by, by, by us, yeah, by the, yeah. By the, you know, the, yeah. So like, you know, they do, uh, we focus on like a new technology, like 3D yeah. printing, AI, these different areas. Okay, great, yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. And before we leave the topic of honors, any other contribution? Can I, make, uh, can I say something slightly yes. different? Yes, sure. sure. We have our honors program, and our honors program follows on to the third year of the bachelor's program. Um, so it is a fourth year, and the teaching does start in the third year, and the contact with the supervisor starts in the third year. But what I'd like to say about the honors program is that it's such a nice introduction to research for students who are performing very well, and we have quite a lot of interest. So we have uh, 15 or so, 15 plus students, depending on which year we're looking at, who have done honors with a variety of us as supervisors. Um, and so we have quite an active group of students who form a community and form a support group for one another, and they interact with one another. So they don't just learn their topic, and learn the research in isolation. They're learning a range of different topics at a much greater depth as they do the research. And because of that, and they're not working in isolation, they get a much better experience um, going through that as a, as a group. Um, so I'm very positive about it. I think it's such a nice 
friendly, fairly stressless, because the project is well defined for the student usually. Fairly stressless uh, project which is achievable. And some of them go on to publish their work, which is such a boost for these young, young people doing their, their best and being stimulated to do better. It's such a positive experience at the University of Sydney that I've had experience of. I really enjoy it. So what happens is that the, each year we get asked by the coordinator to submit all our projects. We do that and the students go around and choose which projects they want. And they end up with um, supervisors who they might never have met before, but who give them an excellent opportunity to learn something about research and have an experience. So as to plan for a future potentially um, academic career or to move into the um, clinical career with some knowledge of how to get good answers for good questions. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Will. It's Kelly, Peter. Can I yeah. just jump in? Because I'm one of those people that I'm going to put the question out there is for universities that haven't got an honours program. So, for example, Monash University do for their um, diagnostic. Um, but this is going to lead in, hopefully, to the next part of the discussion is that obviously a lot of that's the discussion of whether or not you can do an honours is sort of taken out of your hands, depending on which university you've studied at. Um, so I suppose the next question um, to put it out there would be what sort of options then are for people who haven't had that honours program. So hopefully that leads you into the, the next part, because I think honours, and I think Shane made a comment on there, which is fantastic. Um, it's opened lots of doors, mm. which I think it does, absolutely, and I agree with Will. It's a fantastic way if you have that option, um, but some degrees don't have that built in. So, um, yeah, what I suppose the next step is to how do you then get into something that's bite-sized like Will was talking about. Sure. Thanks for the segue, Kelly. That's really good. So I guess the next thing that um, if we go up uh, through the list, I guess the next thing is to do a coursework program that may have some research subjects in it or the ability to do a research project. Now, uh, we've offered that in our program. We have a Master of Medical Imaging Science. We've offered in that program over probably since 2016. And we haven't had anyone take it yet. Some have done some of the research subjects but not finished the specialisation. I'm just wondering if the panel members are aware of similar types of courses and and student experiences. Sorry, it's Kelly again. I'll jump yeah. in. I know Monash have a Master of Advanced Healthcare Practice, so that's a postgraduate course that they can, uh, there are a variety of subjects, so not just radiation therapy, for example, in my background, but lots of, lots of them, and there is a research pathway in there. Um, I know of one radiation therapist who is doing that at the moment, so that becomes, I suppose, like the mini thesis that you would do for an honours. Um, I'm not sure how many others are involved in that program. It's not that old, so it might not be too many because it's sort of the end of that um, coursework master's. So if you were only just starting, you get through all of your, your more basic um, units first, but there's definitely other universities, I'm sure, that do a similar. Um, it's more not, spec and not uh, discipline specific usually because there's yeah. not enough students to, um, to fit in. Uh, it's Paul here. I think that would that would segue very nicely into our situation. Is um, obviously New Zealand's a lot smaller than uh, Australia, both geographically and population. Um, and we uh, can offer a, a Master of Health Science, for example. And there's a number of different um, uh, courses of study that they that students can select to construct a taught master's uh, if you don't want to go down a master's by thesis route but the expectation would always be that there's a methodology paper and there's a, a research project would, would form one of those units so that in your coherent course of study that you have to put together um, you get some exposure to different study designs and you go through um, to some level or other, you come up with an original piece of work and, and, and you do that. Um, depending on how you construct that master's, that, that project can be quite neat and tidy or it can get a little bit bigger. Um, but the expectation would be that there's, there's a research component in there. Um, if you want someone to be 
operating at that postgraduate level, that's that's kind of a, a given from for the way our uh, master's programs are put together. Right, Peter, can I say something? Yeah. Yes, sorry, I had my mic off. No, no that's okay. So um, I'm at CU University and we do have a an honours department where any of the students can choose to do an honours program if they want. I also run um, a re well at the moment I'm running a second research unit, but I run two research units and they're um, used by various departments in um, master's programs, grad cert programs and grad dip programs. So I actually, uh, last term I had um, 135 research students in my unit and it was all taught online. And basically they developed a research program uh, project and did an ethics application, which they could then submit to ethics. And then this term I'm doing the second project, which has 72 students in it. Um, and they're writing up a, either writing up their project or they're writing a, a narrative review on, on a topic, which may be the same or different. Yeah, so, um, but I guess the, I'm teaching this across multiple health uh, disciplines. So not just anything to do with, I guess, medical radiation science or sonography. Um, I'm also teaching paramedics, chiropractics, um, yeah, and um, bringing them all into one, one big unit and um, getting, getting output and getting um, published papers and things like that, yeah. Great, thanks so much, Anne. And um, from my understanding, if, if the coursework program has um, sufficient component to it, it can be a direct entry into a, a research higher degree, such as a PhD. So some universities will have an entry pathway from your coursework masters if it has a project and research subjects components that work towards a certain number of credits to get directly into it. Yeah. So I'm mindful of the time. So um, others can... Comments going up there too, Peter. Oh, great. Thank you. Yeah. I'll, um, I might get, we might leech, uh, leap into the uh, research higher degrees because I'm mindful of the time that we have tonight. And while I do that, I'll have a look at the, the questions. Um, so you have a choice after you've finished your undergrad or um, after you've finished your postgraduate coursework masters to think about doing a research higher degree. And that may be at the level of a master's program or at a PhD program. So what I'll ask the panel members to think about or to contribute is, what is the different difference between the two as far as the actual um, entry into those programs go? And what is the difference as far as the expectation or the length of the actual program? Is there someone willing to start? I can start, it's Kelly. Thanks Kelly. Um, I suppose the thing, when, we, when the committee were putting together this topic, the thing we found was that even amongst just our very small group of, um, of committee members is the entry path, the entry requirements or the prerequisites are quite different between every university. And I think that with it, in the interest of time, we don't want to go through what's required at every university. But the main difference, obviously, in terms of uh, the requirement for a time between a, a master's and a PhD, and therefore the level of, um, and also the requirement from a PhD perspective to be much more novel than, uh, than a master's is something to keep in mind. But I think the, um, the thing that uh, we sort of spoke about when we were putting it together is to keep in mind that if you're interested in doing something, you need to, to probably find that mentor that we were talking about or a supervisor and, and actually then contact and find out what the requirements are. So in the, in the comments, Peter, I popped up that my experience is if people haven't done an honours, they contact the universities and say, I want to do an MPhil or a PhD, and often they don't have a publication. So part of doing that research, um, even if it's a coursework part, as Paul was mentioning, you have to have something that's original and publishable. Um, it doesn't have to be huge, but it has to be something that you've got um, often, uh, something that you can tangible, you can show you've got some research skills. So certainly from uh, my experience, often people come to us without necessarily the, um, the requirements, but most people are then happy to help support someone to get that. So whether or not it's advice of how to get a paper out, people might have already done a poster, um, those sorts of things. So um, some universities might have different um, 
different requirements for an MPhil or a PhD, but from my experience, I think most of them have similar entry requirements, no matter which course you're going into, it's just a matter of how long do you want to be doing your research for. Um, so I'm not sure if anyone else has got similar comments. Kelly, just while you're there and, and other panel members, so what, what do you think would motivate someone to do a master's instead of a PhD or a PhD instead of a master's? What, what do you think is the differences in motivation? Do you think it's the, the length of the study or? Yeah, I think so. Well, certainly from my experience. So, um, you know, that certainly I've had really capable students that have been not sure if they were wanting to commit to four years and that might be where they are in that point of their life at the time. Um, it might be that it just seems a bit too daunting. So, you know, PhD might seem a little bit too difficult. Um, so I think it's more whether that's perceived the difference or there's just the time side of things um, because, uh, and maybe once they start then getting that advice from the supervisors and the mentors and even their panels when they have to present where they're up to, often that's when they get the really good feedback to say, look, you're doing a great job and have you thought about going further, um, but maybe just that bite-sized bit at the beginning. I was going to say, I, I think if someone's not sure about which to go for, then they would probably be better going for a research master's um, because that's probably indicative of not having a topic that you're sure of or engaged with. You maybe haven't got a good supervisor or supervisors uh, or you don't have the research background and some of the things that Kelly was talking about. Um, I think whatever you do, um, certainly I've been very, very fortunate in that I had a, a supervisor some years ago when I did a research master's who I had contact with when I did some postgraduate papers. Um, they ended up being my primary supervisor for my master's and they're now my primary supervisor for my PhD and there's a there's a very very good relationship there um, and I'm sure everybody would agree if you've either in the middle of or have done that or gone through that process um, if that relationship is not uh, good solid uh, one that you can work with, then it doesn't matter whether it's a couple of years for a master's or four or six years for a PhD, it's not going to be a good experience. Um, so finding that connection, the person who can, can supervise you, I would say that's probably the first step before you would do anything. Sorry, Peter, it's Kelly. I'll just jump back in. I suppose the other thing to keep in mind and Shane's comment about being part-time, so it'll be a very long road, is probably the remembering that most people that I've been involved with at least are working clinically at the same time. So two years for an, for an MPhil becomes you know, four years and a four year um, PhD becomes eight years. It's not sort of something that you can knock over very quickly um, up to eight years, obviously depends yeah. on how long you take, but yeah, it's um, it can take, it, it's a long period of time for you. It's not just the, the full time component. It's then the part time equivalent. So. Um, Peter, Andrew here. Can I just yeah. suggest that the choice between masters and PhD largely, in my opinion, depends on what you want to do with it. If, if you're employed in an academic institution, the expectation is pretty much there that you will do a PhD or at least be working towards it. Whereas um, clinically, a masters might be enough it might be seen to be appropriate it's certainly enough under the new south wales mrs award to get you a, a grade increase which is what and i i still work clinically too and i know there um, a lot of my colleagues at wagga hospital are um, doing masters so they can get a pay increase so it depends on your motivation for why you want to do it that that's my experience that's a good point, Andrew. It's a bit the same in Victoria. I think there's actually, well, there was when I was working clinically two pay grades. So there was one for a master's and then an, an additional step for a PhD. I'm just going to throw out there too. Um, it's no longer running, I don't believe, Peter, but I did the Doctor of Health Science through University of Sydney, um, which was a bit of a combined, the coursework from a research perspective, Correct. as well as um, 
as well as the thesis. So it had, I think, three compulsory research methodology um, topics, which um, goes back to a bit what Rondell Joy was saying in regards to just learning what, th what methodologies are out there and then trying to figure out which one's best suited your project. Um, so there are professional doctorates out there, um, not many of them in Australia, but overseas certainly that seems mm. to be something that um, people are moving towards. So something to keep in mind, a bit left field. Yeah. Can, Can I you... come in here? Yeah, please, Will. Um, from the University of Sydney side, we, we don't have that compulsory need to do the coursework at all, but it's going to come back. And they're bringing that back at the moment where students will be required to do some appropriate courses for their course that they're doing. And so there's a list of courses from which they can choose some statistics, some methodology, some research focused, some specifically skill focused. So that is there, but it still remains, the, the focus is still a research project as a PhD. And I think we must just keep going back to the point that was made earlier, that um, the, the relationship with the supervisor is very important. And the interpersonal relationships that we develop as part of our research experience and becoming a researcher um, are actually of paramount importance when we're doing this kind of process. And so I, I would like to recommend that any decision as to whether it's a master's or a coursework master's or a PhD um, always do, is in con conjunction with some mentor with somebody who has experience and can give you guidance depending on what your particular needs are. Because there are many reasons for doing PhDs and masters. And it's not just a one size fits all kind of degree. It's not just ticking a box, it's moving up from one stage to another stage, answering questions as you go and showing your ability um, to be able to handle really high quality, high level questions in your workplace in future years. And that's why you get the pay rise, because you're able to do stuff that people without those degrees really haven't got the experience in the and, and for those who've had a chance to, um, to supervise students through the masters and their, and their PhDs, you do see that personal growth throughout that journal journey and you see them develop new skills and confidence as they go through that whole process. So it's a, a nice thing to, to watch from start to the very end. It's Kelly again, Peter. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll second what Will said. Monash have for the last four years had a, what they call their Monash PhD, which includes a certain number of hours of, um, of uh, coursework, but not in a unit specific type thing. So you might do short courses on statistics or different, a specific type of methodology or a systematic review, and you can pick what skills then build um, your um, skills that you can then yourself with, and that's something to keep in mind. I think most universities offer those through their research um, departments, their graduate research departments, whether or not it's formalised as you must do them and have a certain number of hours. It's like CPD. Um, but the other thing I was just thinking, when, when you asked the question before about what makes the, the choice between an MPhil and a PhD, I think one thing in the past that, that um, certainly people looked at was the size of the thesis that you had to write. So the equivalent number of words, and I think most universities have cut them back a little bit anyway. Certainly, PhD is no longer 100,000 in most. It's maybe back to 80,000. That's our experience. It's 80,000 for us. Um, but I think also the fact that now you can do both of those by publication. Um, certainly, from an MPhil point of view at Monash, an MPhil might be one to two papers, depending on what you what you put out, whereas your, your PhD, you're, you're probably looking at four papers, and that might be also... So the, the size of the output that you need to be able to, to, um, to put out, um, not only in the time frame, but as Paul mentioned about the size the project and how well defined it is and what um, we think might have to get out of that project. Probably something else as a deciding factor. Yeah, and I know, um, I know different, uh, different universities have different approaches to how the thesis is presented for examination. Our experience is that you can include papers in your thesis, but it also, it's wrapped around with bridging chapters and text as well to give yeah. additional information and context. So it's not, it's not a, um, a very thin collection of four papers, but it still 
has a has a sort of an introduction outlining what you hope to achieve and what your aims are probably a systematic or a narrative review that may or may not be published and then a, a number of experiments with additional information about methodology analysis that go beyond the publication if it's there as well and then capped off with a summary um, chapter that talks about the findings and future works and um, yeah and that's my experience from supervising but also from examining yeah. thesis the way they seem to, to head i'm not sure if anyone's um was it i can't remember who it was though i think in new zealand have you got the option to buy a publication is that something that's yeah it's it's um yeah but the, the stipulation being that the the, the publications have to be around a, a coherent project so um it, it had been I, i've been in discussions where it was suggested that people could do four or five not related projects and stick them together and that would work but uh, what you were talking about is an option um and the kind of framework that peter was referring to where it's it's still in the form of a thesis but the, the bulk of it would be in, in the published papers, but there still needs to be a, I guess, a contextualization uh, for the overarching project, which the four papers would result from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So consistent. Yeah. Hey, Gay, would did you have something to say? No. Okay. That's all right. I thought you were going to <laughs> say something before. And I've just seen from um, Shane's mentioned online saying that. Um, University of South Australia has the option to do honours, masters and PhD by publication now, one for honours, two for masters and three to four for a PhD. So I think, I think they're all quite similar for, for um, the different institutions. So the other thing, I'm mindful that our time is running down, but the other thing that I just thought we'd mention is that just to remember that with a coursework masters, there's usually fees involved. This is the Australian experience. I'll ask our, our New Zealand colleagues to confer. But if you're doing a masters by um, research or a PhD, then the government provides a scholarship to actually cover your tuition. There may be some student union fees that you pay, which are, are not a large amount. But the major component of the tuition for a research master's or a PhD is covered by um, a government grant for each student doing that. Not at CSU, Peter. No? No, we charge for PhDs and charge for masters by research, and we're the only ones that do. Okay. <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't aware of that. Yes, yeah, so, uh, we lose a lot of students that way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We certainly offer the, the university and various funding bodies will offer scholarships uh, and the scholarships uh, certainly for PhD would offer uh, tuition fees plus a stipend um, and the not so much for masters but they, they are available um, but there's no universal what we do have is, is, is a fee free first year of undergrad uh, but we don't have anything like that for postgrad. And actually, one of our, our issues, I think, holding back, particularly people in the health sciences uh, and, and health professional disciplines, was the study assistants, so the, the, I guess, company that was owned by the government that students could uh, both borrow money from and get student support from, had a cap as to how many years you could mm. make use of that system. And if you had someone with a, an elongated pre-registration program, that then immediately cut them off from uh, being able to complete uh, some of the postgraduate programs. So that's going to have to change. But in the meantime, it's pay yourself or get a scholarship. Or if you're working um, and you have a very uh, friendly and accommodating line manager who can offer you some sort of assistance with fees that way. But that, again, that's that, that will be very much the exception rather than the rule. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Paul. Um, so th that does mention, that does also bring to mind that um, honour students can also apply for an Australian postgraduate award. And that provides them in addition, if they're successful, they have to, it's competitive. But in addition, they get a stipend. So if they're studying full time, they actually receive um, some money. I can't remember exactly how much it is, whether it's $25,000, uh, but to help with all your living expenses while you're studying full time as well. And some of the universities have university postgraduate awards as well available for that purpose. But that's mainly for the, 
for full-time um, students. Um, we've talked about publications, but I just wanted to mention part of the PhD or master's student journey is that you often will go into conferences and present your early work and the universities may also have funds available to help students to do that. So there's a pool of funds to help students to go to national and international conferences. And that's a really important part of the, um, the research high degree experience. Um, there's also some funds available that allow for the purchase of equipment or if you need um, certain um, external assistance, it could be software that also help you with that journey as well. Um, is there any sort of, I'm mindful that we've hit the, the hour, so I was just going to ask our panel members, is there any sort of comments they'd like to add as we wind up this evening? Things that we may have not um, touched on or possible topics for our next, uh, our next webinar. I'll jump in and I'll ask the question rather than answering it because I think everyone's sick of hearing from me. Um, I suppose the, the, just to wrap it up, we've, we've seen that there's some similarities between universities and um, some differences. If someone online is wanting to get involved, what would be the best tip of how they would start that conversation, find a mentor, find a supervisor? Can I come in here and, and add to that? So I was going to approach it from the other way around. It, I think it's so exciting to hear that we have so many different options at so many different levels. So if anybody's out there who wants to do research, come to one of the universities, ask somebody, and we will help you get involved at the appropriate level in the appropriate course um, so that you can cope with this thing to answer the questions that you all will be experiencing in your lives wherever you are this time. Thanks. Thanks, Will. I think that's a good point. You may want to go back to your original university and uh, make contact with academics or, you know, your alumni that you know them well and, and offer um, research training. That could be a starting point. Or you may do, go to a completely different university. You may have changed location and you're looking for supervisors. You'll find that academics are happy to talk about research programs and research training, even if they're not recruiting you to their particular program just to give you some support and information about that particular journey and point you in the direction if they think um, your topic is a better fit for someone else. That's a good point, Peter, because it's such a small field, medical radiation, that we all tend to know what people's experience and specialties are. I suppose the other thing to keep in mind is often supervisors might not come from your field. You might need to tap in, as Andrew mentioned, about having physios. Certainly our research manager in our department isn't a medical radiation background um, to our head of research. So often they're really good at asking the right questions without knowing the detail. You can have an expert that you can still be, you know, maybe one expert as a supervisor or an external supervisor, but remember that, you know, you want someone who's got the experience to guide you through, doesn't necessarily have to be the expert. Um, um, has anyone else got any other tips? I think we'll, um, oh, sorry, online it was, and and next time you send an email but if they respond in a reasonable time is a good because you know if they're going to get back to you when you when you're one of their students you want to know that they're going to get back to you um, when you send the initial inquiry can um, i just add to that kelly um when i first started out i did obviously a lot of reading and there was one particular academic whose stuff i liked so i emailed him and he invited me to brisbane um to go and talk to him and I, he gave me a day of his time and I, and I recorded all our conversations and he became such a good mentor for me. He was never a supervisor, but it was just because I made that initial contact and he turned out to be, you know, very generous with his knowledge and his time. And I think you'll find um, the more senior a researcher is, the less they've got to prove and the more generous with their time they, they often are. Really good point, Andrew. Um, absolutely. And um, we're not out there to, people aren't necessarily out there to sell their own courses. Obviously, most people are usually really busy. So taking on, you only want to take on people that you know that you've got the skill set to be able to 
to assist. So people are more than happy to have those conversations and help point people in the right direction. Thanks, Kelly and Andrew. In the interest of time, and, and particularly for our New Zealand colleagues, Paul and Gay, who I know it's 11.30 now, and <laughs> they've been kind enough to wait up so late. So thank you for um, staying online. Just to remind you that we do have another webinar coming up next month. Um, I'm going from memory here. I think it's the 6th, it's Wednesday, the 6th of November, and it's on qualitative research. If you have ideas for uh, webinars that you'd like us to do in the future, feel free to drop me or any of the um, members of our group an email and just make those suggestions and we'll try to incorporate those into our future webinars. This webinar will be available um, via YouTube and we'll communicate that through the, the e-blast when it becomes available. So feel free to, to go back and uh, look at it again or share it with your colleagues if you, if you enjoyed um, this particular webinar. I will, um, I will take uh, Rhonda Joy's list of publications and I'll uh, send it around to the members of this um, particular webinar that have given me their email addresses. And if one Owen has an objections, I'll also send the chat around as part of that message as well. So we can um, have a bit of a wrap up about this, this meeting. So thanks again, a big thank you to all our panel members who came along this evening and engaged in the conversation about research training and to our participants. Thank you for your time and, um, and coming along and listening to this particular webinar. So until next time, good night. Thanks. Good night. Nice and thank you. Thank you. Thank you.